References Committee. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. It is with great pleasure that I present the report of the Community Affairs Reference Committee on Speech Pathology Services together with the Hansard record and the record and the and the proceedings and documents presented to the committee and move that the report be printed. Question is the, is the report now be printed? All, that, all those of that opinion say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Senator Seward. I seek leave to move a motion in relation to the report. Is leave granted? <coughs> is leave granted? Hello. Okay. Thank you. Leave is granted. Senator Seward. I move that the Senate takes note of um, this report. Um, this report would not have happened if it hadn't have, hadn't have been for the um, particular um, work of. The, of Speech Pathology Australia, who were so dedicated in working with the committee and briefing the Community Affairs References Committee on the issues that need to be looked at and their dedication and caring um, to speech pathology services um, in Australia. It isn't until I, I bet you many Australians just don't appreciate what speech pathology um, entails in this country and why it is so important. But through the committee process, it has become extreme, extremely apparent that speech pathology, um, communication and language disorders are absolutely critical to people's life outcomes. Absolutely critical. And I see this report as, as probably the matching pair to um, the report that the committee did on hearing services in Australia. Our report on hearing services highlighted the impact that um, hearing impairments and deafness has on people's life outcomes, as do um, a person's ability to um, communicate verbally um, in terms of it's absolutely fundamental to a person's development and well-being. The committee report makes 10 recommendations, but before I start on outlining some of those recommendations and, the, um, and our findings, I want to make sure that I have time to acknowledge the work that Speech Pathology Australia has put in to this, um, committee, to the, into this inquiry, to the uh, many professionals in the, in the uh, speech pathology area that we spoke to, to the parents to um, older people, to people suffering from aphasia um, had, that put into um, making sure that we had full access to the information and also to thank the people that hosted us on various sites, site visits and I'll come to that um, in a minute. But I also particularly want to point out the committee secretariat who, as per usual and once again, went above and beyond the call of duty, um, in particular um, our secretary Jeanette um, Redcliffe and also Richard Grant, who um, have done us proud in terms of the work that they have produced in pulling out um, from the wealth of submissions that we got and very good quality submissions that we got from the people's personal experiences and from the Hansard evidence that we got, um, pulling out what were the main issues. I cannot highlight enough how important it is that we do actually, um, in this country, address issues associated with speech pathology. In fact, our recommenda recommendation um, 10 um, recommends to the federal government that they work with state and territory governments to consider the costs to, it, to the individual and to society for failing to intervene in a timely and effective way to address speech and language disorders in Australia and address these issues in the development of relevant policies and programs. In other words, speech pathology and its implications and communication disorders need to be considered when the government is making um, uh, policy decisions. It is that fundamentally important. We recommend, the committee recommends that the federal government work with state and territory governments and stakeholders to ensure that parents and carers have access to information about the significance of speech and language disorders and the services they can access to address them. What became very apparent during our inquiry is that we need to ensure that um, we have early intervention uh, services in place and that we visited the Australian Stuttering Centre, for example. And you know, we learned that if you can have early intervention in a for a child who's stuttering by the age of six, that child can not only get over the stuttering, but will actually never remember that that child stuttered. We also learnt about the severe 
um, emotional and social well-being um, and, mental, and also um, highlighted a mental illness that can result if people don't get the sorts of that's early intervention and treatment for their um, speech disorders. We learnt that if a child between six and nine, if they can get assistance for their stuttering, for example, um, that, that, that is likely to be successful, that child to completely overcome their stutter. But after that, you can learn to manage your stutter, but somebody has to practice every day. And the longer they go without the support that they need, the, the more impact it can have for their life outcomes. We also learnt that our committee, Community Affairs Committee, always focuses on the data because it is so important. And, and what our committee um, also found out that there isn't a lot of data, and one of our recommendations is, or several of our recommendations, are about the need for data. We don't have a good handle on the demand for speech pathology services um, in this country, and we need to look. Um, we've made a series of recommendations around um, that. We also uh, don't have a good handle on the supply of speech pathologists, and we also need to be looking at that. I would like to take a couple of moments to address the issues that we learnt, particularly from the site visits. We went to see Parkville Juvenile Justice Centre in Melbourne, and I thank the principal of the school, which is an award-winning school in that centre. We were told that over 50 per cent of the, people, of the young people that are in that juvenile justice centre have some form of speech pathology, learning, language and communication disorder. That could in, actually qualify them for support. There was another group of um, people there um, that, in fact, uh, had some form that, of, of speech and language disorder that didn't qualify them for um, support, but that needed to be dealt with. Now, if, if you, if you, if this uh, numbers and the prevalence of the disorder in the juvenile justice system is held up, is is um, the same in other justice juvenile justice centres, and we don't know, we need to know. You have to think, what impact has that speech and learning disorder? had on that, child, that young person's life outcomes. We also learnt about the number of um, older workers who are in manual industries um, who, have, who have speech, language, uh, speech and language disorders and that were never properly uh, supported when they were young people. And imagine what their life outcomes could have been if they had actually had early intervention. But the point that also is raised through that is the number of people that are falling out of manual employment who have never had the support that they need for their speech pathology. It, it is really an extremely important issue that we um, need as, at a national level to be looking at. We, not only national, but state and territories. So we've made a number of recommendations about needing to invest, investigate um, the uh, the um, access to people's access to speech and um, uh, to speech pathology uh, services. We also looked at each state. We, we looked at uh, we we also looked at the availability of services in each state, and they vary. That's also the confusing thing: is access varies, qualification varies. Um, there's a very long waiting lists for publicly available speech pathology services, and in many instances, very long waiting lists for privately available speech pathology services. But unfortunately, privately available speech pathology services are very expensive, and, and that can be a barrier to people um, being able to access uh, speech pathology services. We also went to, and I'm sure Senator Moore will talk a bit more about this, because it's in her home state, the uh, Glen Leiden um, School. So, uh, so uh, she just, so for those listening, Senator Moore just said quite right she will be talking about it. But we saw what an excellent job that school does, and and heard from parents of the of um, the students going to that school, and how again having that early intervention, the quality focus on early education and speech pathology services being integrated into their learning, what a difference that makes to people's life outcomes. Access to speech pathology services can change someone's life outcomes, and that's why government needs to be looking at how um, these services can be provided, what is their demand, 
um, what, where are people able to access services. We also, um, in our report, we also have a very interesting map from um, uh, which, map, which maps access to speech pathology services against uh, the early development index. And that's quite frightening. That's just for Victoria. We're recommending that that be done. Oh, so it's just for Melbourne, not Victoria. We're recommending that, that that sort of information be gathered for all Australian states, so that we do in a, to do make sure that we are able to supply access to and quality speech pathology services. I really do encourage all senators and all members of parliament to to read this report and get an understanding of the importance of these services. Once of, of, of speech pathology, of communication and language disorders, they really are critical. It really is critical that we deal with this issue. Thank you, Senator.